Thank you for coming to my deep dive. And this is about Redshift optimization, in particular using um, our Redshift optimization block. My name is Fabio Beltramini. I'm a customer success analyst with Looker. And as a customer success analyst, I get to see a lot of our customers' models, um, their Redshift clusters, and <laughs> their common issues. So obviously, I spent a lot of time with individual customers looking at their performance issues that they reported to me, uh, helping them on a kind of one-off, one-by-one basis, looking at individual queries, uh, writing kind of ad hoc SQL queries to the Redshift system tables to figure out what was going on. And after some time doing this, I realized I was spinning my wheels. So I decided to build a Redshift block, a Looker block. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with blocks, they're templatized LookML code that you can use to get up and running very quickly with a particular use case. Uh, in the case of Redshift, it's the system tables. So uh, they're very repeatable. They're the same from cluster to cluster. So if you want to use our Redshift block, there's no customization needed. You can drop it right into your instance and just point it at your connection and be up and running with these uh, reports to help you optimize within five to 10 minutes. Um, so objections. You might be thinking, I don't need that. I have the AWS console. <laughs> OK, if you're in this presentation, you're probably not thinking that. Um, but you might have someone at your organization that's going to say that to you. So I'm going to give you three reasons why that you can use with them to uh, kind of sell this internally. Uh, the first one is getting out of the weeds. As I mentioned, uh, there's a difference between looking at something query by query or seeing broader trends throughout your cluster. So that's one thing that the blog is going to help you do. It's going to help you see trends and prioritize your efforts. And I'll get into more detail on that specifically. Uh, the next one is kind of stop context cycling. And that's going to be the latter half of the presentation. And the idea here is when you go to the AWS console, you've got to like look at this thing, look at that thing, try to line them up. What you're doing is a join in your head. You've got SQL. Don't do a join in your head. Use SQL. <laughs> and the third one is empower your team. So probably not everyone here is an administrator on their AWS console. And so what this is going to let you do is anyone who's got access to Looker, you can permission them to see this model. And really, your whole team can help with your performance optimization work. And that might be yourself. You might not actually have permission to, to go into your AWS console, yet somehow you're supposed to you know, keep your Looker instance running quickly. Let's get into specifics. Um, one thing that the block is going to help you do is to know where to spend your time, what to optimize. And so in this case, that really is half of the battle. Uh, generally speaking, here are some pitfalls to avoid when figuring out what to optimize. So first, this is something that I see uh, a lot of customers try to do, is try to optimize tables or schemas in a vacuum. You know, Just put the scheme on paper and say, I'm going to optimize all of these. What you should do is optimize based on actual query patterns. So we'll get to that in a bit. Uh, don't waterfall. Don't make a big project out of setting up the schema for everything before you can start getting value. Do iterate. Do get that minimum logical schema up there on your instance, and then see where are the actual bottlenecks and fix those? Uh, don't prematurely optimize. I see a lot of people trying to kind of denormalize everything uh, up front. Do uh, respect your own time. So this is PowerPoint. It used to be Google Slides. <laughs> Do respect your own time and that of your colleagues. So optimizing joins away by denormalizing might save you, uh, you know, maybe 5% performance based on a well-optimized join. So is it really where you want to be spending your time doing that kind of denormalization work? Uh, so again, identifying patterns is what the block is going to help you do so that you can prioritize your time spent optimizing your cluster. And that's generally going to start from one of the dashboards that the block uh, gives you, which is the performance optimization dashboard. And what that dashboard is, is it basically groups queries and cohorts and patterns uh, onto the dashboard so you can see those trends. And two tiles in particular on this dashboard are going to be the most useful. So uh, that's these two tiles that you see right here. And the first one on the left is a pie chart, because pie charts are real visualizations that everyone should use. Um, but in this case, it makes sense, because what it's showing you is the share of uh, types of network activity. So anytime that you choose to distribute things one way or another way, it's a trade-off. You're moving things around so that some joins can perform better, but some joins will suffer a bit. So in general, you want to look for more green slices than red. And I'll talk about these different um, types of network activity in a bit more detail later. But then on the right, this is really valuable. What it does is that table on the right 
filters out those network distribution activities for the bad types, the red and the orange ones, and then it further breaks them down by the join condition. And this is really valuable for two reasons. One, just because, uh, again, distribution of data and network activity is a common problem and is a significant uh, sizable problem. So it's valuable for that reason, but it's more valuable um, because when you use Looker, Looker generates a big variety of select statements. Users can explore, pick their own fields. It generates a big variety of where clauses based on filters. It generates a wide variety of group by statements. But one thing that is consistent is what's in your model, and those are the joins. So by looking at historical join patterns, you can actually be pretty sure that you're going to be optimizing things that are representative of future query patterns. So that's why this tile in particular is going to be a, a real go-to place for identifying those trends that you actually want to spend time on. And so I've got it uh, sorted. I don't know if you can see in the visualization that second to last uh, column that's total time executing. So I've got 3,000 queries that in aggregate are, you know, I don't know where the decimal place is, but 27,000 seconds or something like that. So the idea here is to, I'm sorry, to prioritize your time on these things that in aggregate are actually consuming the most resources. And then I've got that qualified by time executing per query just so that you can validate that that pattern is actually something that you're going to find some meat to optimize. Um, and it's not just a super fast query that's running super uh, frequently. Um, in true looker fashion, you can take these aggregates of 3,000 queries and you can drill down into them to see the list of specific queries that engage in that, in that join pattern. And that brings us to the second half, which is once you've kind of identified some problem queries, uh, diagnosing and corrective action. Uh, rather than go into too much theoretical detail on any one topic, what I want to do is give you guys five issues um, that are going to represent 90% of your performance problems. And I'm going to show you how to identify them using our query inspection dashboard and give you ideas for corrective actions on those. So uh, the first issue I've pr prioritized is large nested loop joins. Um, and if you're not familiar with what a large nested loop join, it's an issue that can come up in any database dialect, not just Redshift, but the, the block is going to help you quickly identify those. And so uh, it's a situation where your join condition is causing the database to use essentially a brute force, a, a brute force approach to join those two tables. I've got some example typical join conditions there. An inequality join is going to trigger this. Um, text matching when you don't have an actual relationship between tables, so you decide to look for a name inside of a bigger text field is a common situation, or queries, logical queries where you're not constraining two things being equal, but you're saying either this can happen or that can happen. So all of those are going to trigger what you see on the bottom, which is in your query plan, you're going to see highlighted in red, nested loop join. I prioritize this as number one because even though it's slightly less common, it is hugely impactful. Um, it's a very you know, big performance issue, and you're going to want to make this a number one priority to fix. So it's quite easy to, to detect and corrective actions. Um, it becomes a problem when there are large nested loop joins. So see if you can refactor that large nested loop join into a small nested loop join. A, a typical example might be date tables. Um, people will often do kind of essentially a cross join on two date tables by doing a, an inequality on dates. See if you can say, oh, I only really care about, or I can only realistically have 10 consecutive time periods that I care about that I want to actually fan out. So use a, a small table of 10 digits and do a cross join on that rather than cross joining on all possible dates. Another example is, especially for those inequality conditions, can you rewrite this as a window function? And I've got links on both of these to articles on discourse, which again, for those of you that are not customers, is um, Looker's forum for both Looker employees to post, but also for customers to post and share knowledge. And then if all else fails and you really do need to build out this relationship based on a nested loop join, uh, you can do it, but do it infrequently and persist the results back to a relationship table in your database, which then you can use in your explorers and will you know, be optimized by the database. Pattern number two, excessive network activity. The query inspection dashboard is just going to highlight these for you at the top. It's going to highlight these for you at the top as how many megabytes were distributed or uh, broadcast around the network for this particular query. And this is priority number two because it's the most common issue. Redshift by default uh, has all of your tables set to distribution style even. So generally, everything is going to require a lot of movement around the network to, to enable any joins. Uh, so you would identify it based on a 
high number of bytes distributed or broadcast. And in the query plan, which is the third, not the KPIs, not the second section, the third section query plan, uh, you'll see highlighted in red or orange steps with distribution both, which means that both sides of the table had to be shuffled around to enable a join. Distribution outer, which means that the bigger of the two tables had to be moved around the network, or broadcast inner, which means that the smaller of the two tables had to be copied to every single node in the cluster. Uh, as far as corrective actions, uh, they're pretty narrow in scope. It's gonna be all about setting your distribution keys or distribution style. The general concept is that you want to apply distribution keys that are gonna allow both sides of a join to be co-located. So the relevant rows are gonna be already on the same cluster from both tables. Um, some surprising things that I've learned in doing this for customers, uh, kind of like a tip or secret, is that the most effective choice might not already be on that table. Uh, the example I like to give is if you've got a restaurant's application and you've got an entity that's your restaurant, then you've got an entity that's a table that is within a restaurant, and then you've got an entity that represents a seat, which is, you know, belongs to a table. Typical norm normalization practices for a database say that your seat should have a table ID and not a restaurant ID um, because it's logically redundant. You can look up the restaurant ID through the table. Um, for enabling better performance, you actually can use this logically redundant column. Um, for example, in this case, restaurant ID to distribute all three tables by restaurant ID so that wh whether you're doing a join between table and restaurant, they're already co-located or whether you're doing a join between seat to table, they're co-located, or if you're joining all three, they're co-located. So that's a tip that I think most people don't think about right away because you assume you have to choose a column from among the things that are in your normalized schema. For smaller tables also, a distribution style all might be a better strategy. And by smaller, typically that means you know, less than 100,000 rows uh, to where a given column is less than a megabyte since that's the size of the smallest block in Redshift. Um, do not use it as a silver bullet because it comes at an expense at, at a penalty to scanning. And that brings us to uh, issue number three, excessive scanning. This is the second most common issue and it's particularly common when working with large fact tables, uh, event logs, web analytics type data. And again, this is gonna be very easy to pick out on the query inspection dashboard because you're gonna see the tile at the top that says how much data this query had to scan. And a good rule of thumb that I like to use is for every 100 megabytes that you're scanning, that's gonna take about a second. And of course that is distributed among how many nodes you have in your cluster. Then after you see that at the top level, the, that first table there is gonna be your table details, which will tell you exactly which table contributed how much scanning to the query. The corrective actions here are generally gonna be a sort key. Um, so what a sort key does it, is it allows Redshift to say, based on a filter in my where clause, I actually don't have to look at the whole table. I know that the relevant data is only in this part of the table and just skip scanning the rest of it. Um, for your large event tables, that's very commonly gonna be a timestamp column. You know, when was that event logged? So in Redshift, you have to first declare the sort key, but then to make sure that the data is actually sorted so that Redshift can benefit from it when running the query, uh, you have to either run a vacuum job to keep it sorted over time as you add new data, or if you're adding data in um, kind of like append only mode, uh, there is a Redshift feature to keep it sorted as you add new data that is sorted in the right order already. And then the, the third bullet point is pretty important. In Looker, when you go to an explore, you can use the always filter property in an explore to ensure that users who land on that explore are using that filter by default. So they might by default only look at the past seven days instead of by default hitting all the historical activity. And of course, they can overwrite that if necessary. Issue number four is inappropriate join cardinality. So if you're familiar with the term fan out, uh, this is what happens when you've got fan out on top of fan out, sometimes on top of fan out. Uh, a good example is that query there from house, if you join rooms where you've got five rooms to a house, and then you also join residents where you've got five residents to a house, all of a sudden your intermediate result set has 25 records for each house. And that's just a small number, but if you consider you know, large cardinality joins, that can very easily make or break the query. Uh, sometimes we informally say like the query's ex exploded just because it will never finish running. So a lot of uh, clusters tend, uh, and instances tend to have this issue, but it affects a smaller proportion of queries. This one's a little bit harder to pick out. 
uh, essentially you're gonna review the join logic carefully, keeping in mind what are your primary and foreign keys on the, on the tables. Um, but a good uh, kind of hint is if you look throughout your query plan and you see a step that has a high number of rows returned uh, compared to what the tables had in them to begin with, that's a pretty good hint that you might have this issue. Um, and the corrective actions are uh, a few. One is break overly fanned, or overly fanned out explorers into separate explorers if possible. Um, if you wanna keep those different tables in the same explorer but prevent this uh, cardinality issue, you can use a derived table uh, to make that a one-to-one -one join instead of a one-to-many by grouping before you join. Um, I've got a pattern documented on discourse for another creative way to solve this, though it's a little bit more work, so I'll let anybody who is feeling experimental check that out as well. And a, a final approach that I didn't put on here, but now that we've announced merged results, is of course you can uh, avoid this to some extent by using the merged results on the front end to bring together two related data sets. And the last step, we've got just three minutes left, is disk-based steps. Um, I put this one last because a lot of times it's more of a symptom than a cause. So before you look at this one, make sure that you've uh, eliminated things like uh, number four on join cardinality. This one is gonna be flagged to you very clearly at the top. That section would say yes in red. And then you can actually look at the query execution report to find the exact step of the query execution that had this disk-based step. And what it essentially means is that for at least one node on your cluster, for at least one step in calculating your query, that node did not have enough memory to do the operation that was asked of it. So it had to uh, switch to a different version of the algorithm that you know, puts things on disk and does things incrementally and it can be a lot slower. So again, only check for these after ruling out issue number four. And you can use that to find which step had the issue and your corrective actions um, eliminate the other possible problems. This is often caused by uh, distinct operations so uh, a hash join with a lot of distinct values is gonna require a lot of memory. Uh, a distinct aggregate with a lot of distinct values is gonna require a lot of memory. Uh, a group by with a lot of distinct values is gonna require a lot of memory. Um, and one example that I think people accidentally do is when they're writing a derived table, sometimes people use union by mistake when they mean to use union all. So just you know, make sure you know the difference and you're using union all when you don't need union. Um, so try to remove to the extent possible, those uh, memory intensive distinct operations. And then if you just do need that operation, you can, it might just be a, an issue of adding more uh, resources to your cluster, um, specifically memory resources. And sometimes that's constrained by a WLMQ. So it could be your WLMQ that's limiting how much memory the query has available. So you could also potentially increase that if that's the case. Um, finally, in rare situations, it might not be that the overall memory requirement is more than your cluster has, but that for just one node, the memory requirement is greater than what that node has because of an underlying data skew issue. So in that same query inspection dashboard, you've got your table details and you can look at your table skew for all of those tables, uh, just to make sure it's not that issue. And in that case, you can consider switching that distribution style for that table to a more even distribution style, which could be even or it could just be a more even uh, column. So. To recap, uh, with the Redshift block, you're gonna be able to optimize based on actual query, plan, uh, actual query patterns, and you're gonna be able to recognize and correct the five most common or impactful issues. Large nested loop joins, excess network activity, excess scanning, inappropriate join cardinality, and disk-based steps.